You hear about the lady who drove to the mall with her Mercedes Benz and she uh, gets out and she has in the back seat a Labrador Retriever. And so she's trying to get him settled down, rent, has the windows all cracked so he can breathe. And, and uh, as she closes the door, uh, she's, he's back in the back seat there and she says, stay, stay. And she backs away from her, stay, trying to get him to be calmed down and, and just relax in the car and stay. A guy walks by and notices she's blonde and she's, he says to her, why don't you just put it in park? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you have your Bible, get it out and we'll take a look at the scriptures this morning. And we're going to turn to uh, John's Gospel to chapter 2. And we find that at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he is challenged as to who he is. And we find in verse 18, it says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, this is page 1117, John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they uh, that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Right from the onset, Jesus Christ tells about how he would die, about how he would be buried, and how he would rise again from the dead. And this would be the one sign that would set him apart from all others who have ever lived. No one else has ever been able to come back from the dead, but Jesus Christ did. Others have been raised from the dead, but Christ is the only one of his own power to be able to do that. Let's turn over to John's Gospel, chapter 10. And here we have again the words of Jesus. And we read here in John 10, page 1129, in verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Verse 18 says, No man taketh it from me, but I, lie, I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Wow, what words. So Jesus tells us that he had the power to lay his life down, and he had the power to to take it back up again. It's interesting that Christ died exactly at 3 o'clock on the day that he was crucified, which was the preparation of the Passover. And that was, of course, we believe Wednesday of the crucifixion week. And that's why we celebrated this Wednesday his death. And he was nailed to the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. And it was exactly at 3 that he died. Well, that worked out to be exactly when Israel was to offer up their lamb, that he was to die right then at the beginning of what is called the evening of the Passover, which would be the preceding afternoon, as the Passover was Thursday, which really began with the evening first, or Thursday night would have been Wednesday night at 6 p.m., and the preceding afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, is when he died at 3 but you note in the scriptures that it says he yielded up his spirit. He chose the moment of his death to the exact minute. He died exactly when the lamb was to be offered up. And none of us could have done that. You know, the other thieves were still alive. 
but he chose the exact moment of his death and he chose the exact moment of his resurrection and he came back again from the dead as the scriptures tell us that he would 72 hours after he's placed in the grave. Let's go to Matthew now chapter 12 and take a look at these verses as Jesus again is challenged by the religious leadership and in Matthew chapter 12 it says in verse 38, certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. It's interesting that Jonah seems to be one of the books of the Bible that's most difficult for people to believe. And notice here, Jesus tells us that Jonah was a prophet. As of course we know that the scriptures, all of them in the Old Testament were written by authenticated spokespersons for God, prophets. In the New Testament it was written by the apostles and these also were eyewitnesses and authentic spokespersons for God. This is the inspired word of God that God himself is the author of. And he says here that I'm going to give you the sign of the prophet Jonah. Verse 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights, we're talking now 72 hours. In John 11, without turning there, in verse 9, Jesus says, are there not 12 hours in the day? He defines the daylight period as 12 hours, the night period is 12 hours. So three daylight periods would be 3 times 12. And then three night periods would be 3 times 12. Adding that up it would be 72 hours he's talking about exactly. And so he says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the, it should read, the fish's belly. The Greek word here is not whale. And so many people down through time have tried to figure out what kind of fish could have swallowed Jonah in which he could have lived? Because most people don't realize that Jonah died in the fish's belly. And that, of course, was a part of what happened in the King James time. They were uh, really believing that he had lived and were looking for uh, a mammal that breathed air and perhaps air could be trapped. And, and most people have bought the Pinocchio story of Jonah. That Jonah was in there in the fish's belly, sitting at a table. They don't explain where the table came from or where the chair came from. And we imagine a candle on the table so he has light. Where did that come from? And maybe the pictures hanging on the stomach wall of the fish that he was looking at as uh, Jonah twiddled his thumbs for 72 hours before he's vomited up. But according to the scriptures, Jonah died. And we don't know what kind of fish it was. It could have been a minnow. If God prepared a minnow to be able to swallow him, obviously that minnow would have been enlarged sufficiently that he could have uh, in, uh, taken in Jonah. But Jonah died in that fish's belly. And a lot of people have difficulty believing this story that he was then vomited out, went on his journey to preach in Nineveh. But it's a true story. I love the story told about a little girl witnessing boldly to people about Christ and an atheist overhears her witnessing conversation and he begins to say, humbug, this is a lot of hogwash and this is uh, certainly not true. And he goes over to her and says, little girl, I suppose you uh, believe the story of Jonah when you say you believe the Bible. And she says, absolutely I do. In fact, she says, when I get to heaven, I'm anxious to talk to Jonah about his experience. And so the atheist looks over at her and says, well, what if Jonah is not in heaven? She says at him, that you can talk to him then. <laughs> ah. How true. But notice Jesus says here, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Here we learn where Christ went during the three days and three nights when he died. He went to the heart of the earth. He went to paradise. 
In Luke 23, 43, without turning there, he told the dying thief that believed, Today thou shalt be with me, where? In paradise. So we know that he was going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And at the same time, he's going to be in paradise. So we know that paradise was in the heart of the earth. Prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, all of the believers went to the heart of the earth. And in the Old Testament, it's called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is Hades. It's the equivalent place. There was also a place there where the unsaved dead went, and they were in flame and torment. But they were separated from where the saved are by an impassable gulf. Luke 16, uh, Christ pulls back the curtain and shows there are two men who die. A rich man who's unsaved, and a beggar named Lazarus who was saved. And Lazarus is carried into the heart of the earth, into paradise, into a place of comfort. And the rich man dies, and he's carried into the place of torment in the heart of the earth. They could look at each other across this impassable gulf. They could have conversation as the rich man is in flame and torment. And he says to Abraham that he sees across the gulf, send Lazarus to bring just a, a drop of water to cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And we find that Abraham says, son, remember in your lifetime, you had things good, and now you're tormented. But Lazarus, who had things uh, uh, not happen so well for him, is now comforted. And he says, uh, there's an impassable gulf between us two. You cannot pass to us, nor can we pass to you. And there you have the scene in the heart of the earth of where the dead would go. When Christ died, he went down into paradise. He pronounced liberty that the sin debt had been paid by his death. And now he opens up paradise and he takes all those out of the heart of the earth and takes them up to heaven. And so now this side of the cross, we are absent from the body, present with the Lord as believers. The unsaved dead are still in Hades and will remain there until after the thousand year reign of Christ as Satan and his angels are the first to be cast into hell. And then the unsaved of mankind will be brought up out of Hades where they've been waiting. And they'll be assigned a degree of punishment according to their works. And then cast into the everlasting lake of fire. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And this is going to be on page 1253. And if you look at verse 8. It tells us here, wherefore God saith, when he ascended up on high, he, Christ, led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So when Christ ascended, he led a group captive up to heaven. What group did he lead captive? It was all of the saints of the Old Testament, people like Noah, Abraham, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of the heroes you and I know about of the Old Testament, all those that were saved were in this place called paradise. And he leads them now captive on up to heaven. Look at verse 9. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first, where? Into the lower parts of the earth. We just read in Matthew twelve forty, Christ telling us that he'd be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And notice he says here that he descended first before he ascends down into the lower parts of the earth. Verse 10 says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And so Christ here takes all the believers out of the heart of the earth and takes them up to heaven. And uh, then he comes back down to the earth. It's interesting when you talk about far above all heavens, it's talking about beyond all the visible heavens that we can see with our telescopes. And scientists suspect that maybe the horizon of the universe might be four trillion light years away. That means if you could travel at the speed of light, which no one has been able to do, in fact, the escape velocity out of our Earth's atmosphere is 25,000 miles per hour. Seems rather slow 
when you talk about the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. But we find that if you traveled at that speed, it would take you four trillion years to get to heaven. That's why Jesus, being God, who operates, I believe, in more than just four dimensions that you and I are bound by, time and space, that he could go instantly to heaven and instantly return because the God of the Bible operates in multiple dimensions. And, you know, it's interesting to me that all the world religions, in all their writings, describe their God in terms of four dimensions. And they're limited, and they can only do things that you and I could do within those four dimensions. Maybe some things that are uh, greater than we, but they're bound. That's why I believe the God of the Bible really has to be the true and living God. Because if Jesus were taking this group captive right now at the speed of light, he'd only be barely there. And it'd take him four trillion years to get back. Our lives would be over. <laughs> and, and it would be too late, wouldn't it? But he took them to heaven and then returned. And the Bible teaches this uh, throughout the Old Testament and New, that Christ went down into the heart of the earth. Let's go to the book of Jonah for just a moment. And maybe you haven't turned there lately. It's not the book you normally turn to you for your devotions. But uh, let's turn there now. And I'll give you the page number as soon as I arrive. And this will be on page 943. Jonah was one of the very interesting places in the Old Testament where God tells the story of the gospel long before Jesus Christ ever came. We have Jonah, a missionary who doesn't want to do what God asked him to do. He was told to go to Nineveh and he didn't want to go to Nineveh. So he grabs up his life savings and boards a cruise ship. It wasn't actually a cruise ship, but he bought passage on a ship that was headed as far away from Nineveh as he could possibly go. He's out at sea and all of a sudden a violent storm comes that God himself had brought. And the people on board the ship, all the many that were on the ship, uh, began to do everything they could to save themselves. And it's a picture of religion and how that men are not capable of saving themselves. You can work at trying to be saved. You can uh, give it your best shot, but you're still not going to be able to save yourself. Notice, if you will, we find here that they were trying here to save themselves by casting all the things that were on board overboard, lightening the load of the ship, and uh, uh, finally, uh, they, they asked Jonah, why is this upon us? And Jonah says, I'm the problem. I'm supposed to be going to Nineveh, and God is uh, bringing this sea. So in verse 11, they said to him, what shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. Verse 12, he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. What is interesting here is that Jonah was a picture of Christ. And Jonah had to die for all the people on the ship to be saved. We're on planet Earth, or we could call it ship Earth. And this ship is sinking. The Bible tells us that this earth and everything on it is going to perish. Heaven and earth will pass away, Christ said, but my words shall never pass away. And he's telling us in the story of Jonah how that one would have to die for everybody on the shipboard to be saved. And so they, uh, in verse 13, nevertheless the men rode hard. They didn't want to accept the gospel message that Jonah had to die. And so they rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not. It's impossible to work hard or try your best or whatever you might attempt to do to be saved. It just won't work. And so finally, it says in verse 15, they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea 
ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Then if you'll notice on the, uh, in verse 17, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Didn't we just read that in Matthew? As Jonah was three days and three nights. That's a picture of Christ being in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And his body in the grave. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord God out of the fish's belly. There are two different words here translated belly. And we find here that the first is a word in the Hebrew that is mi'ah, and it means abdomen. And so his first prayer was when he was still alive, he'd been swallowed by this fish. And he prays to God. Then it says in verse 2, as the prayer switches, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly. And this word belly is another word that means hollow place. And it should read, out of the hollow place of hell, or that should read Sheol, or this, this place in the heart of the earth we just mentioned, cried I, and thou heardest me. So Jonah here starts his prayer in the belly of the fish, the abdomen, and then concludes his prayer in the heart of the earth in Sheol because he dies. Look at what it says in verse 6. Jonah says, I went down, not to the bottom of the sea, but I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. That's underneath the earth's crust. The earth has got a crust. It's about 8 to 12 miles deep average. And it floats on a liquid magma uh, molten rock interior of the earth. And uh, Jonah went down below that into the very heart of the earth, below the mountains, the bottoms of the mountains. And notice it says here, the earth with her bars was about me forever. If you were ever encased in the heart of the earth, how would you ever get out? You couldn't, unless God would release you. And so Jonah went down to paradise. The same place Christ then went down into and spent three days and three nights. And notice here we have the resurrection of Jonah because it says, Yet hast thou brought up my life from what? Corruption. Corruption is the process that takes place after death as the body begins to corrupt and uh, begins to deteriorate. Here, Jonah's body was raised back up, and Jonah went up out of the heart of the earth, back into that body, and then was cast up by the fish on the shore, and went on his missionary journey. What is interesting is that the fish is a picture of the tomb of Christ, and there Jonah's body was there for three days and three nights. And we find Jonah's soul was down in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. We're getting a special message here. From the heart of the earth. That's not Jonah. He's out of there. All right. So then we find that Jonah's soul went back into the body in the fish's belly and, be, and was raised from the dead and cast out on the shore. Christ's body was in the tomb and his soul was in the heart of the earth. And after three days and three nights, he went back into the body in the tomb, and it was resurrected. And then Christ showed himself alive for 40 days. Wow. Uh, this is a beautiful story. And it's the story of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. And we find that Jonah was a sign to the people of Nineveh. And Jesus said to those people, you want to see a sign? I'll show you the sign. The sign is the marks of the death of the one who had died. Jonah was in that fish's belly, and you better believe that fish was trying to digest him. All those stomach acids were working on Jonah. Can you imagine it probably ate away all the hair on his body? He had no hair on his head, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no body hair anywhere on his body. His body was probably bleached and wrinkled. Can you imagine he was quite a sight? As he walks to Nineveh, he was a sign to those people. They realized this man had come back from the dead. He looked it. He was wearing the sign of his death in that body that had come back from the dead. Jesus also 
came back from the dead and he showed the signs of his death, didn't he? He says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I. A spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And so he shows them the wounds. Christ bore the marks of his death in his resurrection body and they recognized him. We also, when we see Christ, will see him in that very body and will see the nail prints in his hands and in his feet. Isn't that amazing? The Bible tells us when Jesus comes back in Zechariah, it is the Lord speaking in Zechariah 12, but it says that the people on the earth will see uh, me whom they have pierced. When was God as a spirit ever pierced? Never. But God who took on flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ was pierced. And Zechariah tells that hundreds of years before he ever went to the cross and paid for our sins. It was all foretold. And Christ went to the heart of the earth. The Apostles' Creed says that Christ descended into hell for three days. It's wrong. And that's why we don't recite the Apostles' Creed here. As I wrestled with what kind of creed could we recite. And I read every creed that I could find written down through the centuries and they all seemed to be flawed in some way. And I said, well we can't beat reciting scriptures. So I picked out 11 scriptures that you and I recite here every Sunday that you come. Because we know that the Word of God is true and we can comfortably recite those without worrying about whether we're reciting something that's in error. But the Apostles' Creed says that he descended into hell for three days and three nights. That's not true. Some people have imagined because of that that Christ was paying for sin in hell. Not true. Jesus paid for every sin that you and I would ever commit on the cross. When Jesus died, just before he dies, he says, it is finished. And the Greek word is one word, to telestai, and it means paid in full. It's an accounting term. It means full satisfaction received for the debt. And so Christ paid for every sin that you would ever commit in your whole lifetime, past, present, and future, by his death on the cross, and it was fully paid for. Christ then went into the heart of the earth, not into a place of torment, but where the believers were, called paradise. And there he met the dying thief that believed. And after three days, we just read in Ephesians how he led that group captive after he descended into the lower parts of the earth. He led them captivity uh, as he ascended up into heaven. And so now they're in heaven. And of course, in Corinthians, it tells us now paradise is in heaven. And now this side of the cross, all of us when we die, go straight to heaven. If you lived in the Old Testament, you would have died and gone to paradise. And you would have waited for Christ's death at Calvary. But this side of the cross, we go nonstop flight directly to heaven upon your death, you'll be absent from the body, present with the Lord. The Old Testament saints had to go to Sheol or Hades first, and then they were taken up to heaven. Isn't that exciting to know really what did take place? And the Bible talks about it. Look, if you will, in Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61. I'll give you the page number, and you might beat me there, but that's okay. In Isaiah 61, this is an amazing verse. It is a verse that begins with all three members of the Godhead in one verse. It says the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, of the Lord God, it's Adonai Yahweh. This is God the Father. And then it says, is upon me. And the me there is not Isaiah, but it's Jesus. How do we know? In Luke 4, Jesus quotes this verse in Capernaum, and of course, uh, he, in Nazareth rather, and he was, uh, uh, as he read this, said this verse is fulfilled in your ears right now, as it was talking about him. And it says, because the Lord God hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Here's the phrase I want you to see. To proclaim liberty to what? The captives. Who are the captives? The ones we read about in Ephesians 4.8. He led a group captive up to heaven. And here it says that he was going to, pro to proclaim liberty to the captive. And then it says what? The opening of the prison to them that are bound. 
What did Jonah say? He says that he was really trapped in the heart of the earth. The earth with her bars was about me forever as he was enclosed in the heart of the earth. And so it was like a prison. And there he waited in paradise. And Christ on the third day opened up this prison to those that were bound. Let me go to another interesting verse. This is Isaiah 14. This is about Satan. Here he's called Lucifer. And it talks about Lucifer's rebellion and how he attempted to overthrow God and how he was uh, judged and cast down back onto the earth. It says, verse 13, about Lucifer, of chapter 14 of Isaiah, page 726, For thou hast said in thine heart five things, I will ascend into heaven. This was the invasion plan. He didn't realize God knew his thoughts. And so Satan obviously was judged rather quickly on this uh, would-be takeover of God in his throne. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Verse, four, uh, verse 13 says also, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's heaven. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the most high. And God says, yet thou shalt be brought down to Hades. It is Sheol. And that's where Satan will be bound during the thousand years in the place where all of the unsaved of humankind will also be waiting for Satan to be brought up out of that place, cast into hell, and then his angels, and then all of the humans in there will be brought up to be cast into hell. I want you to see verse 17. You are the one, it says here, that made the world as a wilderness. Obviously referring, I think, to uh, the judgment that occurred in Genesis 1-2 and destroyed the cities thereof, probably what happens at Armageddon uh, at the second coming of Christ. But here's the phrase I want you to see. And that opened not, that opened not, that opened not the house of his prisoners. Satan's prisoners go to Hades or that place of torment in the heart of the earth but Satan doesn't have the power to release his prisoners out of that place in the heart of the earth. It's interesting. If you believe the lie of Satan and reject Christ, you'll wind up in Hades. And Satan will also join you there one day, but he doesn't have the keys to let you out. Christ, when he went down into paradise, he had the keys to unlock it and let his captives out. But Satan doesn't have the power to deliver you. If you're looking to Satan or any of the religions that he has founded, which are false ways to heaven, as he'd love to have you believe those different ways and wind up in hell, you'll wind up seeing Satan himself in the same place you will be, in Hades, in torment, in the heart of the earth. But he can't open up the prison to his prisoners. They're all going to wind up in hell with him forever and ever and ever. You don't want to go to hell. And you don't have to. Because Jesus died for how many? For everyone. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's go to John's Gospel now. And we have in chapter 20 the story of his resurrection. One of many of the Gospels that explains this wonderful story. But in John 20, page 1144, in verse 19, it says, The same day at evening, being the first day of the week. This is now on Sunday. I believe Christ was already risen at sundown the previous night. And now much of the day has transpired. And it's late in the day on Sunday. Uh, and we find that Christ appears to his disciples. Notice where the doors were shut, or when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. His disciples had fled. They forsook him. And here they were behind locked doors, hoping that they weren't going to be taken by the soldiers and maybe killed or crucified also. And here, notice in verse 19, came Jesus and stood in their midst apparently right through the wall or right through the locked door. Remember we talked about Jesus being God, 
and operating outside of the four dimensions that you and I are bound by. He didn't need to open the door. He walked right through it. Here is God. And he appears in this locked room with his disciples. And he says, peace be unto you. And that's because they were scared to death. They really thought, as we see in another passage, they'd seen a ghost. And when he so said, in verse 20, he showed unto them his hands and his side. So he shows the marks, the sign of Jonah. The marks of Jonah's death were in his body. So were the marks of Christ's death in his body as he shows this body that had been nailed to the cross and how the uh, uh, wounds were still there in that body. And notice it says here, Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Let's drop down to verse 24 where Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto Thomas, We've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas had seen that body that had been crucified. And look at the wounds that Christ had experienced. They crucified really by putting a spike through this part of the anatomy, which is called the hand. The whole anatomy, including the wrist, was the hand. And we have archaeological uh, evidence that that's the way the Romans crucified. The weight of the body wouldn't be held here, but would be held here between these two bones. And so apparently the wound there was so large that Thomas knew that he could put his finger and it would go right through. Can you imagine a wound that large where your finger, if Thomas put it in, it would go right through to the other side. The spear that the Roman soldier had pierced up into the chest cavity of Christ was apparently large enough that Thomas knew his entire fist could go right up into the chest cavity of Christ. And so Thomas says, no way, no way. That body will never live again. I don't believe it. I don't care what you tell me. Uh, I won't believe it unless I can take my finger and thrust it right through that wound in his hand or take my fist and thrust it uh, right up into his chest. Well, look at verse 26. Eight days later, the disciples again were within, and Thomas this time was with them. Notice, then came Jesus. The doors again being locked is what it means. He stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then immediately he addresses Thomas. He knew what Thomas had said a week earlier. Did somebody squeal on Thomas? No. Jesus is God. He knows the thoughts of every man, woman, and child. He knows what you think. He knew what Thomas had said and what he had thought. And he addresses Thomas directly and he says, Thomas, come here. Reach hither thy finger. Here's my hands. Come on, boy. Come over here. Stick your finger through. And reach hither thy hand and go ahead and take your fist and thrust it up into my uh, chest here, into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. This is a most amazing passage. We don't have any record that Thomas walked over and did it. Maybe he did. But we do have his audible response. Look at what he says. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. He realized Jesus had to be God for that body to live again, for Christ to be standing before him, for Christ to be speaking to him and appealing to him to come over and check out the evidence. I'm back. Here is the sign that I promised, the sign of Jonah. Look at the marks, the wounds that I still sustain in my body, and yet I'm alive. I have the power to lay my life down. I have the power to take it up again. Jesus is God who came and took on human flesh and died for you and for me. This is the story. And it's interesting here that Thomas had to be convinced, you might say, against his will. It wasn't that they blindly just believed, oh, he's going to come back from the dead. We find that even when the women were told that Christ was risen by the angels, they told the apostles. And it says in Luke 24, 11, that Chris read earlier, it says, and these words seemed to them as idle tales, 
and they believed them not. Wow. The disciples didn't even believe until they saw. And then they became dynamic witnesses, willing to die for this message. The same ones, the night of the betrayal, that had fled from Christ. And Peter denied him three times. We find now become willing to stand up and speak up, recognizing that they might be killed. In fact, history tells us that most all of the disciples were martyred because they spoke out about Christ. But they were not afraid to die. They knew that Jesus was risen and is alive forevermore. And it didn't matter that they were going to live with him forever. And should they die in his cause in proclaiming this message, so what? You know, the worst thing that can happen to a Christian is really the best thing. You know, if you drop dead, you're going to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. How wonderful that is to know that you'll be with him immediately upon death. And so as a believer, you don't have to fear death. The Bible says that this fear is taken away. If you're in an airplane and the airplane's going to crash, the plane might go down, but you're going to go up. Isn't that great? You know, you don't have to worry because as a believer, we're going to be absent from the body, uh, present with the Lord. And as a believer, this is the uh, expectation that we all have. And it can change our whole life because it gives us courage that we might be able to speak up for Christ and share this good news with others. There's a lot of folks that don't know about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. In fact, it seems like all the TV documentaries uh, really leave you confused and bewildered as they say, and I guess they'll say it tonight on TV again, who is Jesus? And you scratch your head when they get all done and say, well, they sure don't know. Uh, obviously, they have no clue. Uh, I'd love to get on one of those programs myself and be able to say who Jesus Christ really is. But he is God who came and died for you. And he paid for your sins, all of them. And the best news I ever heard was when I was 18, I trusted Christ as my Savior. Let me just illustrate with this. Uh, I'm going to take my right hand, and I hope you'll learn how to do this because it's a wonderful way to illustrate the gospel. I'm going to let my hand represent everybody here. I'm going to let my hymnal represent sin. All of us have sinned. And I love the fact that we have hymnals of this, cover, this color. <clears throat> In the Bible, it says that sin is really represented by the color red. <clears throat> In Isaiah 118, the Bible says, Come and let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet. It's red. And so the color for sin is red. And here we are, we're all sinners. And the Bible tells us that no sin can enter heaven. Where there's sin, there's death. And so death would enter heaven if you entered heaven with any sin. If you paid for sin, it would be by separation from God in hell. Your works won't save you. Just like those sailors on board that ship where Jonah was, rowed hard, they prayed, they did everything, but it didn't deliver them from the, the storm that was about ready to sink that ship and everybody would have perished. And so you'll perish unless you have a Savior. Jonah was a picture of that Savior, my other hand representing Christ. He is that Savior. This white sheet of paper representing His righteousness. Jonah had to die. And then Christ, that he pictured, had to die and pay for our sins. What happened was our sins were laid upon Christ and He paid for them. And He was buried and He came back from the dead. When you trust that He did that for you, the Bible says there's an exchange made where He paid for your sin, but He credits your account with Christ's righteousness. And so the believer is no longer seen with their sin, which would condemn them to hell. Christ took that sin and paid for it, and by his death, he now made it possible for you to receive his righteousness. And God looks down upon the believer and sees you righteous because Christ paid for every one of your sins, past, present, and future. Christ said, you want a sign? I'll give you the sign of the prophet Jonah. What's interesting to me is he picks the most difficult story in all the Bible and lays his credibility on the line. And if the story of Jonah is a myth, then Christ is a myth. Light a match to your Bible and walk away. But Jesus said, that's no myth. That's a real story. And God told it to give the gospel message and to firmly implant it in Jonah's mind. And when he went to Nineveh, 
Guess what? He was a living example of what Christ would do when he would die on the cross. That he would die. And his death brought about salvation for those that were on the ship that was sinking. And he's now risen from the dead and alive forevermore. And the Bible says the greatest revival that ever took place was in Nineveh. That city was spared because they changed their mind, the Bible says, and believed the preaching of Jonah. And Christ, of course, was the one that he pictured, and Christ came back from the dead. And he's alive. And today's the day that we celebrate that. Uh, this is the day is special to us as believers as we recognize that we have a living Savior. And all year long, hopefully, we commemorate that every time we meet on the first day of the week. We are remembering Christ is risen from the dead. Isn't that great? Every Sunday is a resurrection Sunday for us as believers. In fact, every day is because we have a risen Savior. But those are special days that we set aside every week to remember that Christ is alive and risen from the dead. Let's bow in prayer. With heads bowed and with eyes closed and with no one looking around, my friend, if you came today and didn't know where you would spend eternity, chances are maybe you've never understood the gospel message, the plan of salvation until today. As long as you work, as long as you row, as long as you pray, as long as you are trying your own way to get you to heaven, you'll never make heaven, my friend. Jesus had to die. He had to shed his blood. And you need to trust that he did that for you. And that he was buried. And then he came back and has the evidence of his death in his body that's risen, showing us that he's the same one that was crucified that lives today and forevermore. And when we see him one day in heaven, we'll see the wounds in his hands and in his feet and be ever, forever reminded of his love and how he was willing to die for you. Right now, before you leave this room, you could receive the gift of eternal life. You could trust Jesus as your Savior and be assured of going to heaven right here before you walk out the door. How? Just whisper a prayer between you and the living God. Just tell him, God, I'm a sinner. I don't understand a whole lot about the Bible. But I believe Jesus died. I believe he died for me. I believe he was buried. I believe he came back from the dead. I believe he's alive at this hour and forevermore. I trust Jesus Christ right now as the one who died to pay for my sin. I trust him right now as my Savior. I trust him as my only hope of entering heaven. And the moment you do, God up in heaven knows and he saves you. Would you do that right now? It's the most important decision you'll ever make. If you're looking for a feeling, don't. We're never told to look for a feeling. Those are misleading. You might feel saved today and lost tomorrow. But one thing never changes. That's the word of God. And God wants us to believe his word. If God said it and you believe it, my friend, that settles it. God is never going to change his word. It's going to be true tomorrow, a hundred years from now, a million years from now, forever. And God's not going to trick you or lie to you. Just pray that prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner, but I trust Christ right now as my Savior, as the one who died to forgive my sin. Give me the gift of eternal life. And the best you know how, when you trust him, God up in heaven knows and he saves you. And you're saved forever. Then you need to make a second choice if you want to be rewarded in this life and in heaven to serve him. And service has to do with rewards and God's blessings. But salvation is a gift purchased by what Christ did for us on the cross. If you just prayed that prayer this morning, God up in heaven knows and he saves you. I'm going to close the service in a word of prayer. We'll sing a chorus and we'll go out the door. But just before I do, I'd love to be able to rejoice with you and pray for you if you trusted Christ as your Savior here this morning. Maybe you on the internet right now would trust the Lord as your Savior and receive this wonderful gift of eternal life. But if you did it, what I'm going to do, while no one is looking, every head is bowed, every eye is closed, I'm going to be the only one looking. And I'm going to ask in just a moment if you prayed this prayer to trust Christ right here this morning. I'd like to have you let me know in just a moment by a lifted hand. I'd like to include you in the closing prayer. No one's going to have you forward. No one's going to embarrass you. No one's going to uh, come running up and grab you by the shoulder. No one will even know.
and I'm not going to point you out. But if you trusted Christ, I'd like to know and I'd like to be able to uh, share in your rejoicing and pray for you. Would you lift your hand right now and let me see. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you and you back there. And God bless you. And God bless both of you. God bless you and you. All right. Anyone else? I trusted Jesus Christ right here this morning as my Savior. I'd like to have you know so you could pray for me. God bless you. Yes, I see your hand. God bless you. Over here, I see your hand. Anyone else? I trusted Christ. God bless you. I see your hand. Yes, I do. Anyone else? Raising your hand doesn't save you. I can't save you. Only Christ can save you. But my friend, the Bible message is right on. It's never been wrong. And your whole eternity is based upon your acceptance of Christ. Would you trust him right now? Anybody else that would say, include me. I trusted Christ. Pray for me as you close. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these many that by the hand here this morning have indicated they trusted you as their Savior. Lord, uh, we ask you to give them assurance. Let them know it's really true. This is not a fairy tale. This is something that really happened, confirmed in history, demonstrated by the resurrection of Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's God who came and took on human flesh and died for each and every one of us here and those around the world. And that everyone could go to heaven if they would only trust you. And that we have the privilege of being able to share this message with our family, with friends, and we can lead them to a saving knowledge of Christ. And be assured that whenever they die, they'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that came today. And we pray that we might be different because we came, that we might be reminded again of this wonderful, wonderful message that is proclaimed from Genesis to Revelation. And how that we have so many times stories like the story of Jonah that anticipated and prophesied of the gospel of Christ and actually showed the three days and three nights, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ as Jonah was a complete picture of the gospel. Bless each one. Bless our church. Lord, we pray that we might be able to win many to Christ before you return. We know you're coming again. And as believers, we're going to be with you forever. And we look forward to that. We ask you to bless now as we conclude. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>